Stay tuned for Butler on Business, coming up next on the Liberty Express. Okay, welcome back to Butler on Business. Jason, would you please introduce Peter Klein to the listeners? Thank you, Alan. We're joined on the phone now by Dr. Peter Klein. He's Dr. Klein's research focuses on economics of organization, entrepreneurship, and corporate strategy. Dr. Klein, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure to have you. Well, Dr. Klein, today we'd like to um, discuss the role of the entrepreneur in the economy. I know that's something that you've um, put a lot of work into during your career, but um, I wanted to start off by really asking you what insights from the Austrian perspective, do what insights do Austrian economics tell us about entrepreneurship? Well, thanks. That's a great question. Um, one of the odd things about uh, the entrepreneur is that while almost everybody recognizes anyone in business, anyone in policy recognizes that entrepreneurs are critical to a market economy, uh, entrepreneurship per se has sort of an awkward role with economic theory. Most of the mainstream economics textbooks uh, barely mention the entrepreneur at all. In fact, if you look at most of the introductory textbooks in economics uh, courses and in, even in some MBA courses, uh, you don't even find the term entrepreneur in the index. So the entrepreneur is this sort of shadowy figure in mainstream economics. Everybody sort of thinks that he's important, but nobody knows what to do with them. The main exception to that is the Austrian school, which uh, since its uh, origins in the 19th century in Vienna, hence the name Austrian, um, has always given the entrepreneur a very central role. And that's partly because the Austrian school, uh, unlike the sort of mainstream approaches, does not emphasize static uh, equilibrium mathematical modeling of the economy, but rather sees the economy as sort of a living dynamic uh, process in which individual actors are making decisions and bearing uncertainties and exercising responsibility to sort of drive the market uh, forward. And that's exactly what the entrepreneur does. Dr. Klein, I'm what they call a serial entrepreneur. I mean, even back when I was in grade school, so it's the only existence I've ever known. But as a entrepreneur now with government regulations, with all these mandates and everything, you know, it's just a lot easier to offshore the jobs. I mean, why would somebody, I mean, we need the jobs here. Right. So, but, and it's painful, but now your decision isn't to have jobs here. It's in which country are you going to export right. these jobs? And, and who wants to start hiring people here in the United States? Right. Well, it's, it's an excellent question. Um, I think it's, it's, uh, there are many different aspects to, to the question. Part of it is a lack of appreciation for entrepreneurship and the market more generally in today's political climate. But I think also um, when people talk about the overall economy, the macro economy, uh, one of the legacies of uh, John Maynard Keynes and the dominance of so-called Keynesian thinking in macroeconomic policy is this very highly aggregated focus where the only things that people care about are uh, total spending, aggregate demand in the economy, uh, uh, you know, what government spending, government fiscal policy and monetary policy can do to move the economy forward or backward. There's very little appreciation for what we might call the microeconomics of economic growth and economic development, the fact that the Federal Reserve can't just push a button, that the Treasury Department can't just flip a switch and make the economy speed up or slow down like some, of, some kind of a giant machine. They know, in fact, there are individual actors, individual decision makers like yourself, entrepreneurs who are thinking about whether or not to start a new, uh, to start a new business, whether to expand their existing business. Uh, whether to do it here or somewhere else. And you're absolutely right that the cost, not only the cost of current rules and regulations and government interventions, but also the anticipated costs of future rules and regulations are a huge factor that uh, stymie the growth of business and restrict entrepreneurs from creating jobs and doing the other things that, of course, we want them to do. One of the big problems uh, that's holding back economic recovery today is what the economic historian Robert Higgs termed regime uncertainty. And he coined this term from studying the Great Depression in the 1930s. And there's a lot of evidence from entrepreneurs and other decision makers in the 1930s that one of the reasons they held back for so long that they weren't willing to make investments, they weren't willing to hire workers, they weren't expanding their activities during the Roosevelt administration is because the New Deal was such a big thing and uh, the FDR was constantly introducing new huge policies, then taking them away, then changing them, sort of rewriting the rules 
as he went. And this uncertainty about what the government would do, what the economic climate would be, was something that held back recovery. It partly explains why the Depression lasted as long as it did. And that's exactly what we see now with, uh, with bailouts, with massive stimulus, with health care reform, and so on. The rules are changing every day, and nobody wants to make a long-term investment in that kind of climate. Well, you know, when you stop and think about, since you threw out the tarp, and, you know, they said it was $800 billion, and they morphed it into $3.3 trillion. think of how many businesses we, we could have started with that money. Absolutely. And, of course, when the market is making decisions about which entrepreneurs get funds for investment and which businesses succeed or fail, you know, we get a far better outcome than when we have government planners deciding who's uh, the favorite and who's not the favorite and when winners are being picked in Washington. Well, I think one thing that is worth pointing out is that our situation here, particularly for our entrepreneurs, at least entrepreneurs, at least in my lifetime, we are at an all-time low. Partly because of just the way things have been structured now, but we were taking a look at manufacturing something here. We always give the U.S. consideration, although it it gets very little consideration nowadays. But we have exported so much overseas now that some of the components we need cannot even be manufactured here anymore. Right. Well, I I mean, that's a good point. And I think some of that is due to, you know, the natural advantages and disadvantages in different parts of the world and the fact that communication costs have gone down, transportation costs have gone down, and so on. We We would naturally expect a certain amount of, for example, manufacturing to migrate to places where uh, the standard of living is lower and where wages are lower and so on. But at the same time, you add on to that the problems with the, uh, the, the U.S. regulatory state, the uncertainty we already talked about. Th- those are just things that add to the cost of doing business domestically, and it just isn't feasible for many entrepreneurial activities to be organized here in the U.S. or in places like Europe and to some extent Japan. That's why some of the, uh, you know, uh, where entrepreneurship is really thriving is in the developing world, in uh, East Asia, and even to some extent in Latin America, uh, because these are uh, more like frontier areas where uh, uh, governments are more willing to let entrepreneurs experiment with different activities. And, of course, that freedom to experiment and the freedom to fail and not be bailed out by the taxpayers when you do fail is something that's critical to entrepreneurial, uh, to entrepreneurial success. Now, what suggestions do you have to relaunch President Reagan's Age of the Entrepreneur? (laughs) Well, that's a good question. Uh, You know, I think the things that make entrepreneurship thrive, or uh, put it this way, I think the best that policymakers can do is to provide an environment in which entrepreneurship can work on its own. You know, and that that sort of... uh, implies the obvious things about reducing regulations, uh, reducing taxes, increasing economic freedom, removing trade barriers, and so on. But I think it's important to caution, too, against kind of an activist uh, impulse in the other direction. One of the problems, uh, one of the dangers I see, is that as entrepreneurship is starting to get a little bit more attention in the media, among policymakers, and so on, you know, the politician's natural instinct is to say, well, X is a good thing, we ought to have more of X, let me do something to increase X by creating a bureau, creating a program, starting a fund, spending more money, put, laying down more rules, and so on. So you have a lot of states uh, and even the federal government looking at incub- business incubators and small business development funds and increase in government R&D and so on. I think that's the wrong direction to take, that entrepreneurship, you know, especially entrepreneurship, is not something that can be planned from the top down is not something that can be micromanaged. And trying to have the government pick winning entrepreneurs is no better than having the government pick winning banks or anything else. You so know, basically what the best the state can do is not mess it up. One thing I think our listeners may or may not be aware of, but with all the, with the government crowding out in private capital formation, there's yeah. not money out there for entrepreneurs to launch their business it's all going to fund this massive deficit of ours. No, that's right. And, and, you know, we don't have enough time for me to get started on a rant about the deficit and the debt ceiling and so on. But one of the things you notice in the current discussion about the debt limit is, you know, an idea that sort of government borrowing is in an entirely different category from private, uh, you know, market borrowing, that 
you know, Treasury bills are somehow sacrosanct. Uh, the uh, Treasury bill must always be risk-free. It's sort of a whole different class of investment. I think that's a misleading way to look at things. Um, there are lots of opportunities for people uh, to invest their savings, and why government uh, securities should be privileged above all other kinds of investments. As you point out, this is just taking money away from alternatives where it could be put to more productive use and having it go into Treasury bills. So to me, there's nothing, nothing magic about a T-bill that says it should not have any default risk whatsoever, whereas other kinds of securities and venture funding and so on you know, ought to be. It's okay for them to be risky, but heaven forbid if, the, if a government were ever to default on paying its loans funded by taxpayers, that the world would sort of come crashing to an end. And I think that's uh, completely uh, an, an unwarranted fear and sort of fear-mongering on the part of policymakers. Well, go ahead. Ran on the federal debt. Gosh, well, I hardly, hardly know where to begin. Uh, you know, there, of, of course, there's, uh, there's the, the mere existence of the debt itself, uh, the vast magnitude of the U.S. federal debt, uh, which, is a, which is a reason to rant and rave. Um, you know, the debt, of course, is – I mean, debt has a lot of direct problems. You mentioned crowding out uh, in the previous segment and the responses that uh, the way that the Fed, for example, creates money to monetize the debt, as uh, Representative Paul said in the little sound clip and so on. I mean, those are all important problems. But ultimately, the debt is a symptom of, a, of uh, the underlying problem of a government that is too large and out of control, um, just as, you know, with a household or a business – uh, when your uh, when your your expenditures vastly uh, exceed the amount that you take in, um, the fact that you have a debt or a deficit is a, a current period deficit is a problem, but it's a symptom of a deeper kind of a spending problem or a cash flow problem or a business model problem. So that's the root pro that's the root issue. But then how uh, the uh, the debt is being dealt with at present and this whole debate about uh, raising the debt ceiling and so on, it's. I'm sure it's frustrating to you guys, just as it's frustrating to me, and presumably frustrating to a lot of your listeners. If, if uh, you know, a lot of your listeners are um, uh, presumably business people, entrepreneurs, uh, and 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 all of them understand household finance. And you know, the idea that when your credit cards are maxed out, the first thing you should look to do is to get an increase in your credit limit. Um, you know, that strikes anybody as sort of obviously bizarre short-sighted, irresponsible, and so on. So I think most Americans recognize that, um, you know, if you can't pay your bills, you've got to learn to live within your means. Uh, you don't solve the problem by borrowing even more to pay off the debts that you have already incurred and, you know, it goes on like a giant Ponzi scheme. Everybody recognizes that that's a problem, everybody outside of Washington, D.C. So that's point number one that we have to find some way to get control of government spending and the expansion of regulation and the other things the government does. But then specifically on the debt ceiling, um, you know, I, I, nobody, nobody likes the idea of a default. I mean, default is not, uh, it's not in absolute terms a desirable option. No individual wants to declare bankruptcy and try to renegotiate his debt. No business, of course, desires as a first best option not to pay its creditors or to renegotiate with its creditors, restructure its debt. But every business person recognizes that under particular circumstances that may be the least bad outcome. And this notion that's in the popular discussion about the debt, you know, that any kind of quote unquote default is not an option that any notion of restructuring the debt or asking holders of treasury bills to take a little bit of a haircut along with everybody else, that that's completely unthinkable, that that would lead to a global calamity and a complete meltdown of the world financial system. I think that's, a, that's just fear-mongering. Uh, that's an unsubstantiated uh, claim. And uh, there are a lot of ways to handle the situation that we find ourselves in now, but simply borrowing more money uh, to meet current obligations does not strike me as the most desirable or the least undesirable outcome. What would you do about the debt? I mean, as far as since the Federal Reserve mechanism is what allows them to incur this debt, are you an uh, advocate of getting rid of the Fed? Well, I am in the long term. Well, sorry, I, I, I should say even in the short term, if, if it could be done. So, I mean, uh, the root cause of the problem is the government budget and the existence of the central bank, which facilitates almost, you know, limitless uh, government borrowing and deficit spending and so on. 
So yes, that's the kind of the root cause. Uh, you know, in terms of the the, the uh, you know sort of the problem that we're in right now, assume that we cannot get rid of the Federal Reserve System immediately. We can't completely redo uh, the way government uh, does its business right away. There are a lot of other things that can be done in the short term. For example, um, every business person knows that when there's a cash flow problem, uh, one uh, one alternative is often to get rid of assets, to sell assets. Um, there's a lot of academic literature and management literature about firms in financial distress, firms on the verge of bankruptcy look to, looking to shed assets to generate cash and meet short-term obligations. Well, the U.S. government holds a lot of assets in its portfolio, land, uh, the, the oil that's in the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, you know, buildings, of course. Um, that's an option that we should certainly be looking at now is for the government to sell off some of its assets. That would be one way to meet, uh, you know, interest payment obligations without a tax increase in the debt ceiling. But yet, you know, it's, it's sort of considered kooky to mention something like that. Can I ask you, what was it like to be a free market guy out there when you were at Berkeley? <laughs> well, it was a little different. Uh, Berkeley is not known as a, a hotbed of free market thought. Uh, Christina Romer, uh, President Obama's first uh, Council of Economic Advisors chair, was one of my professors. Um, you know, it's sort of uh, Berkeley is a pretty, you know, a sort of left-leaning, social democratic, but, but mainstream technocrat program. Of course, the community of Berkeley is just as wild and crazy as it was in the 1960s. But, you know, the university is staffed by sort of Keynesian technocrats, just like every other large, you know, prestigious university. Uh, now, I was fortunate in those days. Well, even today, there's a, there is a thriving free market community in the San Francisco area. When I was a student at Berkeley, uh, the Mises Institute had its administrative headquarters uh, in the suburbs of San Francisco. Uh, the Center for Libertarian Studies was also located there. So I had a community of friends and colleagues with whom I could, uh, uh, you know, vent my frustrations and uh, enjoy some uh, companionship. But it wasn't easy being a student then. But I'm, you know, I'm glad that I that I toughed it out. Well, Dr. Klein, you're, you put together a series with Joseph Salerno a while back called The Fundamentals of Economic Analysis, A Causal Realist Approach. And that was one of my first introductions to Austrian theory. And I appreciate you guys putting that out there. And that led me to discover the great thinkers like Rothbard and Mises and Hayek. Uh, what do you think about the recent resurgence of people coming to Austrian economics and, and coming to discover these ideas? Oh, it's fantastic. I mean, if there's been any silver lining in the financial crisis and the Great Recession, it has been this resurgence of interest in the Austrian school, partly because a lot of commentators, even more mainstream commentators, have recognized that the boom-bust cycle that we went through, that the prolonged uh, housing boom fueled by credit expansion by the central bank, followed by an economic collapse, fits very well with the so-called Austrian theory of the business cycle, that it doesn't, it doesn't seem to square with the Keynesian model or uh, the so-called rational expectations model or the other theories of macroeconomics that dominate the mainstream textbooks. And people have been looking for alternative explanations. What's going on? Did anyone see this coming? Why did Bernanke say the housing market was doing great, you know, right before the bust? Why did all the top Keynesian economists say everything is fine? The only people who sounded any warnings about the housing boom being a bad thing, uh, being an unsustainable boom that would not last forever and might lead to some problem, were by and large people trained in the Austrian tradition. And uh, there's, you know, uh, as a result, uh, the Austrian school is getting a lot more attention. Some of your listeners may have seen the great uh, rap videos, the Hayek versus Keynes rap videos made by Russ Roberts and John Papola. Those have also done a great job reaching kind of the YouTube generation and letting them know that Austrian economics is relevant, uh, it's contemporary, and it's hip. Well, Dr. Klein, we certainly appreciate your time talking with us today. We hope you continued success and really want to just thank you for all that you continue to do for educating people on what we consider to be very important ideas. Well, it's my pleasure. Thank you guys for having me, and I look forward to talking to you again uh, very soon.